This is workshop one. It's not the usual kind of workshop for this module. Usually I'll give you questions to look at, discuss with each other, work on. Um, in about half of them, we'll have postgraduate helpers coming around, giving you uh, hints if necessary, or I may give you some hints from the front. Um, I'll get you to vote sometimes. I'll give you solutions to some of the questions from the front sometimes. Um, there'll be a variety of different things happening. But today's different. This one, this workshop is really... Uh, an interactive session to tell you something about the module. Well, you've already got a bit of a feel for the module because we've had two lectures. But uh, let's see what some of the official documentation says. Now, there's more information in the module information document that you've already collected, um, and there's lots more information on Moodle, and you'll get more emails from me than you uh, know what to do with. Um, but if I send you an email, there'll usually be a reason for it. So uh, do look out for emails from me. Um, you can, and maybe some of you have, set up uh, the announcements you get from Moodle. You may receive them as a, as a digest of all recent messages rather than individual messages. I've got, I've got it set up so that I get messages through the Moodle news groups. I get them. Um, each one individually, and they come as soon as they're sent. But uh, that's up to you. You can change the way you receive your messages from the Moodle News Group, and if you'd rather get the messages straight away, and, and I might be saying, this question sheet or the solutions are now available on the web, and you might be impatient to want to get them straight away, um, but if you're willing to wait until whenever the digest comes out, you can do that too. Um, but if you do get a strain, something strange that says Moodle Digest G11FPM, don't delete it. It's not spam. Um, it's probably a message from me. So what is this module about? Well, if you want to carry on and do pure mathematics, once you've found out what pure mathematics really means at university, since pure mathematics seems to be rather different at university than it was at A-level, um, but if you decide you want to do any more pure mathematics, and you've got to at least do one more pure math module after Christmas, um, after that, uh, you can choose whether you want to carry on with pure maths in year two. Uh, if you want to do any more pure maths in year two and beyond, you want to get a solid foundation. And this is the first foundational module on that. It's to get you used to the way of thinking that you need in pure mathematics. And to get you solid in your reasoning, in your expression, um, give you practice with definitions, proofs and examples. I always think those are the three key things, definitions, proofs, and examples. Uh, so yes, we'll do a little bit about some basic counting principles. Um, in the old days when this module was first set up, there was a, very, a lot about how to count various different kinds of things. That's been reduced somewhat, but we will still have a little bit involved with the binomial theorem and a little bit of counting. Um, but uh, for me, the more important aspect of the, way, of the module, the way I teach it is definitions, proofs, and examples, and not just me writing proofs and you memorizing them, which is not really useful. Um, if I write a proof, I want you to understand it in such a way that you don't have to memorize it in order to produce it, because if you really understand a proof, then you sort of magically can produce it yourself. Just, uh, you can just start writing. and it, if you, Once you get good enough at proofs, um, especially the routine kinds of proofs, and they're only a small... Especially at the early stages, there are relatively few proofs which have interesting ideas in. There are a few which have clever ideas in, but most of the early proofs I'm going to show you have, uh, are relatively routine types of proof. Um, and you can learn the types of proof. Now, this is not the same as learning to do integration and differentiation, which is routine at a different level. But there is a notion of a routine kind of proof, that you can learn, but you have to get a bit more deeply into the maths before that sort of thing becomes routine. So ideally, most of the proofs that we meet in this module, by the time you've understood them and understood how to write proofs, you will come back to look at those proofs and think, oh, that's a fairly routine kind of proof. Um, and you'll start be able to, you won't have to memorize them because you're, the proofs will almost write themselves once you get to that stage. That's, that's the desirable outcome anyway. Um, but Maybe you won't get quite that far in this module. Maybe you'll get a bit closer to that next module. Um, certainly, by the time you get to second year, I hope that you start to detect 
patterns and relatively routine things that are going on inside proofs that mean that you don't have to think about the routine bits, you only have to think about the clever ideas, which you sometimes need. So you will be given a chance to write proofs. In fact, you're going to have to be able to write proofs yourself if you want to get really good mark in this module, um, because there are unseen parts to exam questions, which have got bits in that won't be exactly the same as anything you've seen before, and where you'll have to maybe even have an idea, uh, or at least be very good at doing routine proofs. So here are some of the things that I've mentioned, counting problems, binomial coefficients. Um, we'll see those later. The language of set theory we started already, sets and their elements, okay? Um, relations of functions are coming up later, um, so I won't say much about that now, but you know quite a lot about functions already. We're going to formalize it a bit. Um, every now and then we're going to hit a, pro a question, some of which don't have very good answers, like what is a set? doesn't have a very good answer, I'm afraid. Um, but what is a function? I'll at least explain what functions are using sets. So we'll at least, as long as you believe, uh, once you know what sets are, uh, at least there's a good chance I can tell you what a function really is. Um, and then at the end you get a fun bit, um, which some people find difficult. Okay, there are sets with certain numbers of elements in, um, maybe some finite number, like 10 elements or 100 elements, okay? And then there are sets which got infinitely many elements in, and we met a lot of those uh, already because there's the natural numbers, the integers, the rational numbers, the real numbers, and they've got infinitely many elements in. But it turns out that some infinities are bigger than others. Now, rather strangely, it's going to turn out that the infinities you use for the natural numbers, the integers, and even the rational numbers, all the fractions, those infinities turn out to be the same size, but the infinity that comes in for the real numbers is bigger. Now, this is not obvious at all, and so that comes at the end of this module as a slightly more challenging bit. Um, on the other hand, anybody who's interested in it can find a video of mine called Beyond Infinity. If you look up Beyond Infinity and Joel Feinstein on YouTube, it'll take you straight to my video on all the different kinds of infinity. Um, and you can find it on my blog as well. Um, I've got a blog all explaining mathematics. You can look on that. You'll find links to all my videos. Right. So now, I'm going to ask you a question. Let's just check that I've got the numbers zeroed. You shouldn't have to think about this. But what I want to know, we've got a rough idea. At school, did you learn anything much in the way of, and we're doing A first, okay? <laughs> we're going to do A and B separately. So first of all, I want to know, did you learn much in the way of formal definition of the mathematical concepts? Were you really told a definition of a prime number that, um, that worked to tell you whether one was prime or not? Um, were you told a definition of what it meant for a function to be continuous? Or were you just told some functions are nice and you've got, you can draw them with a continuous line and, and they're continuous? Or did you get a formal definition of continuous? So, did you get taught a lot? Did you get taught a bit? Uh, or you've got basically nothing? Okay, so if you, if you could vote on, on A to start with. Got 47 answers so far. We're up to 78 answers. Okay, well, I think that should give us a rough idea. So if I. Uh, oh, 86. Okay, so what have we got? Uh, looks like the majority going for B with substantial numbers on A and C. Um, so there's quite a lot of variation in the class, we can see, right? Um, but perhaps most people, for most people it looks like we've got, um, we were taught a bit of this but not very much, which doesn't surprise me um, in the way of formal definitions. Uh, which is, but uh, I don't think definitions are very important at A-level because the most important thing is to recognise what kind of question it is and then to do whatever calculations you need to get the right answer. Um, and it never turns out to be crucial what the precise definition of a continuous function is or what uh, any of the other things you're working with are because you know how to do the questions anyway. But in this module, if you don't know the definition of the concept, you can't answer the question. 
Um, if you don't know whether one's prime or not, then if a question comes up where that's a crucial, important thing, then you can't answer the question correctly. And that will be true for every other definition we meet, which means that every definition in this module is really important. And that's true throughout pure mathematics. It's no good having a rough idea what something means. You need to know what it actually means. Um, otherwise, you can't answer the questions. You also need to get practice at working with definitions and seeing what you can do when you know the definition of something, because sometimes a question is answered almost as soon as you write the definition down. The nice thing about working with definitions is that some questions are just designed to see if you know what the definition is. You write the definition down, and you've almost finished the question already, and you only have to do write one more line. Okay, now let me zero the answers. I want to see... So I'm just going to get rid of all the answers. Okay, and now you can, get, you can answer the, the formal proofs bit. So I'm not going to count proof by induction, even though it's useful if you've already done proof by induction. But what I really want to know is, were you shown any other methods of proof? Um, did you do much in the way of any other kind of proof other than proof by induction? Did you do quite a few proofs by contradiction, for example? Things like that. Okay, so if we can get some votes on that, I'd like to get some idea of how the class splits on whether you've seen proofs or not. Okay, got 109 answers already, so to give you a rough idea of where we stand, um, there are more people on C than on B. Um, there are some people on A. But it seems like I'd say most people are on C um, with a reasonable number on B and a few on A, which I'll just remind you what those were. That means that a lot of you saw little or nothing in the way of proof at school. Um, most of the rest of you saw a bit, but not very much. And there's a small minority who were taught a lot at school. Okay? So bear that in mind when we go through stuff. Um, some of you will find some of what I do easier than others because it will look familiar because you did quite a lot of it at school. Um, I'm, I expect that quite a lot of the abstract stuff I do will be new to everyone. Um, or almost everyone, but there's definitely some differences within the class, and uh, most, people, most of you have not seen much in the way of proof before. And there's going to be a lot of proofs in this module, and lots of different kinds of proof in this module, and because that is part of the foundations of pure mathematics. Okay, now... Every module has a set of education aims and learning outcomes, and we're supposed to make these clear to you at the beginning of the module. Um, actually, this isn't quite the comprehensive list. You'll find a few more listed if you look at the catalogue of modules. But basically, the idea is that I'm laying the basis for, uh, for what you're going to need for the further study of pure mathematics, which is going to be roughly divided into algebra and number theory and analysis in future years. Um, all of those go uh, in various directions, and they start to split quite substantially in third year. In second year, it's basically there's, there's two modules on analysis um, and one bigger module on algebra and number theory. In third year, um, you start to get lots of modules of specialising in every direction in pure mathematics, if you want them. But you need to get the foundation straight. If you don't get the basics right, then the later modules will give you trouble. Okay, so here's a, some knowledge and understanding. You need to be able to solve simple counting problems. How many of this type of thing are there? We'll do a bit of that. Um, notation of set theory, that's going to be very important. Um, Again, you have to be able to use the notation. You've got to be able to understand it when I use the set theory notation. You've got to be able to use the notation yourself because I may ask you, give me an example of a set with some properties. In which case, you've got to use the notation correctly because if I can't figure out what you meant, 
then it's wrong. Um, so you've got to use nota set notation correctly. Um, relations, equivalence relations, order relations, we'll come on to that a lot later. Okay? Um, but order relations are things like strictly less than, less than or equal, strictly greater than, greater or equal, various different relationships numbers might have between them. Equivalence relations are rather different, um, and um, I'll explain that when we get to them. Um, but uh, now, here's a bit that gives trouble every year. Um, in the formal theory of functions, there are notions of injective, surjective, and bijective functions. And um, I ask for the definitions of these, and what I see when I ask for the definitions of these, and I can't promise I will always ask for definitions of these in the exams, but they are some of the favourite things I like to ask for definitions of in the exams, and I do recommend that if I ask you for a definition in the exam, that perhaps you write the same definition as you were given in the module, um, or something that absolutely means exactly the same, and not something that vaguely resembles the correct definition, but doesn't quite pin it down, um, or you're not going to get those marks. Um, I like to give what I hope are some easy marks on the exam um, for just telling me what some standard things mean, which is just repeating the definition for the module. Not many marks going for it, um, but it, you know, it's absolutely basic. If you, if you can't tell me what a concept means, how can you possibly work with it? But curiously enough, students do find it difficult to give me a correct definition. Um, once you start varying from a standard definition in the module, then um, you're at risk. Um, if you really do know exactly what it means, you're likely to write something that makes sense and get most of the marks. Um, if you're not clear about exactly what it means and you don't write exactly what I said in the module, things usually go wrong. Um, and injective, surjective, and bijective have given a lot of trouble in the past. Okay, so it's going to turn up later which functions have these properties. Um, first part of the question is typically, what do these things mean? Next part of the question is, give some examples or look at these examples and tell me which properties they've got, or give me some examples which have got some combinations of properties. Um, and if you don't understand and can't work with these definitions, then you can't answer that sort of question. Right. And then distinguishing between countable and uncountable sets, that's the different kinds of infinities that I mentioned already. Um, the kind of thing that I could talk about in my video, Beyond Infinity, um, we'll have a section on that at the end of the module where we'll look at the different kinds of infinity, as well as the finite sets, of course, um, as part of our counting. Right. Uh, intellectual skills. These are fairly generic, but um, let me have a look at these. Right, yeah, so the ideas are fairly complex um, that you meet in this module. If you've never met them before, it gets a bit abstract. Um, and you're going to be asked to take these complex ideas, and these abstract concepts, and look at familiar situations that are similar to things we've done in the module, or novel, I might give you something that looks rather different from anything we've done in lectures or classes. Um, but if you really understand what you're doing, then you'll be able to apply the kind of stuff we've been talking about and demonstrate that you understand what you're doing. A lot of this module, a lot of the marks in this module go for demonstrating your understanding, which means that you should have understood it, and you should be able to explain yourself clearly enough that I can tell that you understood it. Um, so explaining yourself clearly and correctly based on actually understanding stuff. Uh, right. Working with abstract concepts and in a context of generality. Well, okay, there's lots of abstract stuff in this module. Uh, logical thinking and analytical working. Um, yes. Um, all this stuff about the difference between there exists and for all, you've already done a bit of that today, and most of you got that right. That was a good start, right? Uh, most of you knew whether you were looking for a counterexample to demonstrate something was false, or whether you were looking for an example to demonstrate that something was true. And most of you got that right. So that's a good start. Um, you have to keep that up. Um, your, logic, you, you have to, your logic has to be... Uh, Correct. You have to, uh, your reasoning has to be right um, and not full of holes. Um, I'm going to be telling you a bit about backwards proofs later. If I ask you to prove that if A is true, then B has to be true too, if you come along and show that whenever B is true, A is true, then you'll get no marks at all, or maybe one. Um, backwards proofs. If, if, uh, if you prove the reverse implication to what I'm asking, um, even if what you've proved is true, um, if you haven't answered the question, you're not going to get many marks. 
And that's what I call backwards reasoning, which we'll see some warnings about later. Uh, right, so this is very different from A-level. Um, and it's hard work, but not just hard work, it's the right kind of hard work, right? You need to understand what I say in lectures, and you need to be able to prove that you've understood it um, by writing clearly, by using correct logic, by giving illustrative examples that actually illustrate what you're trying to illustrate, not examples that are irrelevant to the question. Um, the, que the examples you give have got to be the right kind of example. And it's got to be an example that I can follow. Normal, the best examples are the concrete examples, like the best example of this is the number three, not the example is a number x unspecified that I'm not going to tell you, and then I can't tell what your number x is, and I don't know whether you've come up with an example. If I ask you for an example, you should make, usually go for a concrete example, like the number three, or the set of even integers, or the set of positive real numbers, or something like that. That's a concrete thing. Whereas um, an, an example that works will be an example of this type, and you give me some description of it, um, is far less convincing, because there might not even be any, as far as I can tell from that. Right. OK. So, I'm giving you the unannotated slides um, as we go, and I'm filling in the gaps, and you should fill in the gaps. And um, people have asked me, can I issue the filled-in version of the slides? And why don't I issue the filled-in version of the slides? Um, and there's a reason I don't do that, because um, it's very easy to collect a complete set of materials from a module without looking at any of it. Um, if I make available a complete set of written-in slides, it's very easy for people to not come to lectures, collect a complete set of annotated slides, and decide to look at them the night before the exam. But I have to warn you that the uh, amount of work required in a 10-credit module, it's supposed to be 100 hours of work. And 100 hours of work cannot be done in the night before the exam. Um, in particular, looking at and understanding and revising all the material from this module the night before the exam is not going to work. I can tell you that. Um, right. So, if you miss a lecture, and you may miss a lecture because you're ill, or for some other good reason, the video will be available. And you should take your notes with gaps and watch the video and fill in the gaps that way. That's the best thing you could do, because then you really have... Uh, that's the closest you can get to attending a lecture that you've missed. OK? Um, and that's OK. Um, you've missed out on participating in the votes. You missed out on the discussions. You missed out on the interactive elements. But at least you can listen to what I said and fill in the gaps. If you just collect um, a set of notes from the lecture, I have to say... Uh, you've missed something because I don't write down everything I say. I'm not writing down what I'm saying now. Um, so um, people have found that the videos are very useful for this. Um, people have found it very useful having gone to the lecture and taken notes and gone back and looked through the notes again. Um, the best students will still find things that they didn't completely understand, even after looking at it, um, and thinking about it for a bit. And quite often, those students, the best students, will go back to the video, fast forward to that bit of the lecture, especially when the recordings worked, and find out what I said at that, at that time. Because I will have said more than I wrote. And sometimes what I said is helpful. And sometimes it may not be. But at least sometimes what I said actually helps make a bit more sense than just what I wrote. So that's how I recommend people should use the videos from this module. You can also get a complete set of videos from 2012 to 13. Well, almost complete, anyway. Um, occasionally, something goes wrong with a video. Um, hopefully, not too often. Um, the syllabus has not changed much this year. So, um, feel free to look at those. You can get ahead that way if you want. You're welcome to look at any of those videos. Um, and almost nothing has changed. So, uh, pretty much the same syllabus. Um, I've changed some of the slides slightly. Um, and I've changed the arrangement slightly. Some of the lectures were stuffed a bit too full and I've rearranged the material a bit. But other than that, um, it's pretty much the same as it was in 2012 to 13. OK, when I'm asked questions, of course, the most frequent question is, what will be on the exam? So let me ask it for you. What will be on the January exam? 
Well, I'm sorry I can't uh, actually hand out the questions in advance. Uh, that, that, that would be useful. Um, and moreover, uh, you, you do get three years' worth of questions. Um, uh, three years' worth of exam papers with solutions and feedback on those solutions are available on the Moodle page. Now, I've only taught it in two previous years, so three years ago it was taught by uh, Dr. Zacharias instead. Um, his solutions to his exam are still there, and that exam is still worth looking at. He had a, pretty much the same syllabus. Um, he asked pretty much the same style of question. Um, I may emphasize a few bits more than he did. Um, the bits that I think people find hard to understand, I emphasize a bit harder than maybe he did. I don't know. Um, so there are very slight differences, um, but you've got three years' worth of questions you can look at. Um, now, as well as the questions and the solutions, there is also feedback. And um, surprisingly, a lot of the mistakes made in 2012 to 13 were also made in 2013 to 14, in spite of the fact that I'd given a complete set of feedback available in advance on the 2012 to 13 exam. So I suggest that you read the feedback on the 2012 to 13 and the 2013 to 14 exam papers, at least, um, at some point, maybe after you've tried those papers, of course, it may be better to try the papers first and then look at the feedback, um, because at least then I won't see all the same mistakes again in 2014 to 15 that I saw in the previous two years. Uh, having said that, it's not going to be the same exam paper. They never are. Um, how much of my exam paper is predictable? I do throw a few predictable bits in, because I want to make sure that everybody gets a reasonable number of marks. It's quite hard to fail my module if you've tried hard. Okay? Um, so fine, getting to 40, if you've understood a reasonable amount, um, and you've learned to do a few standard routine things, and you've looked at the past exam papers, I think you can pr you'll probably get to 40%. Um, you might not, but you probably will. Okay? But uh, if you want to get... A first-class mark, that's 70% plus, you're going to need to do a bit more. Um, quite a lot of the exam paper will test your knowledge and understanding and your ability to express yourself and prove that you've understood it, right? Your ability to work with definitions, to be able to give sensible examples, to be able to prove relatively easy things, but things you haven't seen before. When I say relatively easy, of course... If you haven't seen it before, and you're just coming to this for the first time, that means it's probably hard, okay? It may be that when you look back at it next year, you'll say, that's pretty easy, why couldn't I do it, okay? But uh, in your first approach, okay, anything new is hard. But from my point of view, I'm going to try not to set anything that's horribly, unbearably challenging in the first year exam. Um, it's going to be what I regard as within range, but still discriminating between the best and the very, very best, so that to get 100% on my exam is pretty tough. Um, it means that you've really got to be fluent on all the material, understand it, and you're going to have to have a few ideas in the exam as well if you want to get 100%. Um, to get 70%, you don't have to get quite that far, but you've got to have a pretty good understanding of the material for the module and be able to prove it by writing coherently. Um, so that I can understand what on earth you're talking about. And uh, you don't get marks per paragraph in this module. Um, so uh, a common question I used to get in second year still was, how could I got such a bad mark on the exam when I wrote so much? Okay. Um, unfortunately, if you write a lot but it doesn't have any relevance to the problem or it is completely logically flawed and doesn't, have, and doesn't hold water at all, then the most you're going to get is charity marks for that. Um, I do, read what everything, I do read everything that people write, unless you cross it out. Uh, I don't read crossed out work. There's too many of you in the exam for me to read the crossed out work. Okay? Um, so if you cross something out, I won't read it. Otherwise, I will read everything you write, but that does mean that if you write nonsense, you may, it may detract from your mark. Um, and... Uh, I will read through, if you write a lot of stuff and you can't quite answer a question, I will read through looking for evidence that you know what the concepts mean. I give a few marks for that, demonst demonstrating that you know what the concepts mean, a few, more marks, a few more marks for trying to work in a sensible way with the concepts. Um, 
and the rest of the bots actually go for a coherent and correct answer that actually solves the problem. Okay. So what types of exam question might you meet? The standard material, which I call bookwork. Bookwork includes definitions, proofs, statements, of definitions of concepts, which, as I said, I ask quite a lot of definitions um, just to make sure that people can clearly state what things mean, and unfortunately, people lose a lot of those marks. Um, there are a lot of marks going almost for free if you can correctly state what a definition means. Uh, of course, there's a lot more marks going for really understanding the definitions and being able to work with them. But there's some marks going for actually just being able to state the definitions correctly, even if you didn't understand it. Um, memorization without understanding is very hard, actually. Memorisa memorizing stuff when you don't understand it is really rather hard. And um, it almost always leads to uh, mistakes which lose you the marks. So it's much better to understand it um, because once you've understood it, you've almost simultaneously memorised it. Um, it's quite hard to understand something without not being able to write it. Um, okay. Um, book work. Okay, then the standard statements of famous named results. I'm not going to ask you, um, please state the third theorem on page five of, of lecture three. That's not going to happen. But I might say, state the fundamental theorem of arithmetic or state Bezu's lever, or state some famous named result from lectures. Um, so then I can ask you to state it, and the closer you are to correct, the more of those bookmark marks you'll get. I may ask you to prove something standard from lectures. Now, um, often I'll give you the statement then. Um, so often I'll say... Here's a, stand, here's a statement. I may, or may, I may not tell you this is a bookwork statement from lectures. I may just give you the statement and I'll say, uh, here's a statement, prove that this is true. Okay? But if it's bookwork, that will be exactly a statement that I've stated in lectures and given you a complete proof in lectures. So that's a bookwork proof. Bookwork proof. You can try to memorise bookwork proofs without understanding, but it's not recommended. Uh, Memorisation without understanding is very hard a rather unpleasant activity and unlikely to work. Um, usually comes out garbled if you didn't really understand it. Um, so not recommended. But if you understand the proof, you've got a lot better chance. And if you've got good at writing proofs yourself, you don't even need to remember the, how the proof went because the proof will write itself um, because it, most of the proofs are a standard type. Okay. Um, book work. Okay, so what else? Well other stuff, or similar stuff, right? Um, coursework questions, or bits from the solutions, or bits from workshops, anything like that could turn up as well. Um, anything could turn up in an exam, but generally I give a bit more credit to something if it wasn't book work. So, uh, obviously, if so, I could ask you something, a book work proof, that I couldn't possibly ask you a similar level of proof if it wasn't book work, because... Um, that would be too hard, it would be unfair, especially if there was a, a clever trick to it. Um, well, having said that, I can ask anything, but, um, but I give a lot of credit. If it, if, it's, um, if it really is not book work and it needs an idea, then there's going to be a lot of marks going for it. Okay? Um, so, uh, and that'll be in the sort of unseen parts of exam questions. So there you are, all these different things you could have. Unseen, but of a standard type, Okay, so yes, that might be a similar question, but with different numbers in. Um, or slightly different from something. Okay, a standard type, we'll do, very, we'll do several of each type of question in this module um, of this standard type, and at least you'll have some of those available, which you will recognise and you will be able to do easily in the exam if you've got good at that standard type. Unfortunately, as I said, I'm only throwing in enough really easy routine stuff to get you to about 40%. Maybe, maybe if you're really good at routine stuff and remember all the definitions and can state stuff correctly, maybe you can get to 50 or 60. But you probably can't get to 70 just by doing routine stuff and memorising stuff. If you want to get to 70, you're probably going to have to do a bit more. Okay, so some parts of that question may be entirely unseen and you may have to prove stuff that you've not seen before. So, 
In other words, some bits are quite difficult. And if you want to get 100%, you're going to have to, have to do the difficult ones as well. Uh, marks are very variable on this module. Um, I get a lot of people scoring between 50 and 60 on this module in the past. Um, and I think that the people who get between 50 and 60 um, do it by looking at past exam papers, getting very good at the routine stuff, but struggling with what the concepts really mean and struggling with the proofs. And so I, you know, if, if, you, don't, if you don't really understand everything, you've still got a good chance of getting to between 50 and 60, if that's really what you want. Um, if you want a really solid foundation for next year, you should be aiming higher. If you're thinking you want to be a pure mathematician, and you like this stuff, and you want to take it further, and you want the solid foundation for next year, you shouldn't be trying to just get between 50 and 60. Um, you should be getting over 60, um, trying to get over 70, trying to get over 90, then you're in really good shape, and so on. Okay. Um, so, what's, what should you do if you want to get 70, 80, 90 in this module? Whatever we discuss in lectures and classes, you should look at it afterwards and find out if there's anything that you didn't quite follow at the time. Um, try and sort it out. And if it still doesn't make sense, try to make sense of it. And you can try and figure it out yourself. You can go back to the video, see what I said. You can discuss it with friends. You can look in books. You can come to see me. I'm happy to see people who are finding concepts difficult because some of the concepts are difficult in this module. And I'm happy to see people, as long as you've thought about it a bit, right? Uh, I'm not so happy to see people the day before the exam who say, could you explain everything in this module, especially what do I need to know for the exam? I haven't actually looked through the lecture notes yet. Okay? Um, and you do get some people who, who do that. Um, but uh, I'm very happy to see the people who've had a look through the lecture notes, thought about it a bit, finding a concept hard, and have got a question about it. You can come and see me at the end of the lecture, uh, except sometimes we have to get out um, before the next people come in. Um, you can uh, come to see me in my office. I'm there a lot in my office, so it's easy to find me. I have put on my schedule some, some official contact hours. You can see me those, um, but um, um, it's pretty easy to find me anyway. So uh, send me an email. If you, I'll answer email questions quite quickly. I read my email much too much. So uh, if you send me an email, you'll like to get quite a quick answer, unless you've caught me at a particularly busy time. Um, Memorization without understanding will be of limited use to you in this module. Yes, you can get some marks for memorization without understanding. You can get quite a lot of marks if you're really good at it, though it's a rather painful activity, and I don't recommend it. It's almost useless um, for actually understanding stuff um, and for what comes later. So, you know, if you do short-term memory cram for this module, then when you come after Christmas to do the next module on pure mathematics, then you'll have wasted a lot of your time because it's not going to help you. Um, okay. So, here we are. We're going to be stopping early today. Uh, let, me let me delete the... Uh, let me get rid of these answers. Let's see how honest you can be. Because it is anonymous. I want you to think about how you're going to approach this module. <clears throat> because maybe you're expecting this module to be hard and you're not sure you're going to be able to cope. Or, but I can tell you that you, you wouldn't be here if you weren't strong enough to cope. But it may be hard work. Okay? So you can abandon this module and decide you're going to just try to pass it and scrape through somehow. And you can do that. Or you can try to do as well as possible. I'm wondering which type of student are you intending to be at the moment? You might change your mind later, but what's your intention at the moment, and do you think you're going to be able to stick to it? Are you going to be put in the work? Are you going to do what I said? Look through everything, try to understand it, um, resolve any issues that you can't. Okay, let's see, what, let's see if any of you can vote. You're free to vote now. Let's see what we've got. And, uh, well, we've got quite a split, I can tell you that.
Okay, so we've got a majority for A, but substantial minorities for B and C. Okay? I'll remind you what those are. Um, it's about 47% of you are planning to work hard in this module and try to do as well as you possibly can in it. And the rest of you are going to muddle through somehow. Okay, that's what you're declaring at the moment. Um, all right? Um, this B, studying the question of the solutions from the last few years' exam papers, will probably help you to pass, but it's not going to get you to 70, and it may not get you to 60. Um, it's a good thing to do, but you have to back it up with some more understanding than that and more fluency than that if you want to get over 60, over 70, maybe 80s or 90s. So I hope that some of you will come to believe that you'd rather be in the A group than in the B and C group, um, but I can't force you to. Okay? All I can do is try and encourage you that A is the best way to go and uh, hope that some of the people who are currently in B and C will uh, change their minds and at least have a go at, at version A. Okay, well, we'll stop there for today. Oh, yeah? What are your office hours? I can't seem to gain access to that.